Searching for and Maintaining Peace A Small Treatise on Peace of Heart by Father Jacques Philippe Part 3 What the Saints Tell Us The following are excerpts from writings of various saints. Juan de Bonilla, Spanish Franciscan in the 16th century, author of a splendid little treatise on peace of soul. 1. Peace, the road to perfection. Experience shows us that peace, which sows charity, the love of God and love of neighbour in your soul, is the road that leads straight to eternal life. Take care to never let your heart be troubled, saddened, agitated, or involved in that which can cause it to lose its peace. Rather, work always to remain tranquil, because the Lord says, Happy are those who are at peace. Do this, and the Lord will build in your soul the city of peace, and he will make of you a house of delight. That which he wants of you is that, whenever you are troubled, you would recover your calm, your peace, on your own, in your work, in your thoughts, and in all your activities without exception. Just as a city is not built in a day, do not think that you can achieve in a day this peace, this interior calm, because it is within you that a home must be built for God, while you yourself become his temple. And it is the Lord himself who must handle the construction. Without him your work would not exist. Remind yourself, moreover, that this edifice has humility for its foundation. 2. Maintain a free and detached soul. Your will should always be ready for every eventuality, and your heart must not be enslaved by anything. When you form some desire, it should not be such as to cause you to experience pain in case of failure, but you should keep your spirit as tranquil as though you had never wished for anything. True freedom consists in not being attached to anything, it is in this detachment that God seeks your soul in order to work his great marvels. Footnote. This passage was translated directly from the French editions Tra Traité de la Paix de Armes, a treatise on the peace of souls, Juan de Bonilla, Editions Notre Dame de la Trinité Blois, 1964, and La Paix in Interior, interior peace. Juan de Bonilla, editions Leon de Judah, 1991. St. Francis de Sales. 1. God is the God of peace. Because love only resides in peace, always be careful to conserve the holy tranquility of heart that I have so often recommended to you. None of the thoughts that render us anxious and agitated in spirit in any way comes from God, who is the Prince of Peace. These are the temptations of the enemy, and consequently one must reject them and not take them into account. One must everywhere and in everything live peacefully. If pain comes to us, whether internally or exteriorly, one must receive it peacefully, if joy should come to us, one must receive it peacefully, without wincing because of it. Must one run from evil? It must be done peacefully, without being troubled. Otherwise, in fleeing, we could fall and give the enemy the leisure to do our sin. If one must do good, one must do it peacefully. Otherwise, we will commit many faults in our eagerness. Even in matters of penance, one must do it peacefully. Letter to the Abbess du Puy d'Orbois. 2. How to obtain peace. Let us do three things, my dearest daughter, and we will have peace. Let us have the very pure intention of will to do all things for the honour and glory of God. Let us do the little that we can toward that end according to the advice of our spiritual director, and let us leave it to God to take care of all the rest. 
why should anyone who has God for the object of his intentions and does whatever he can be troubled? Of what should he be afraid? No, no. God is not so terrible with those who love him. He is content with very little because he knows well that we don't have much. And know, my dear daughter, that our Lord is called the Prince of Peace in Scripture. And consequently, everywhere where he is the absolute master, he maintains all things in peace. It is nevertheless true that before bringing peace to a given place, he makes war with it, separating the heart and the soul of the most loved, familiar and ordinary affections, that is to say, the exaggerated love of self, confidence in and complacency with oneself, and similar, similar affections. Now when our Lord separates us from these passions, so sweet and so dear, it seems that he flays the heart alive and we experience very angry feelings. It's almost all we can do to struggle with all our soul, because this separation is strongly felt. But all this spiritual agitation is, however, not without peace, as, finally, overwhelmed by this distress, we neither fail for this reason to conform our will to, to our Lord's will and to ma maintain it there, riveted by this divine pleasure, or do we, nor do we abandon by any means our duties and their accomplishment. Rather, we carry them out courageously. Letter to the Abbess du Puy d'Or. 3. Peace and Humility Peace is born of humility. Nothing troubles us but pride and the esteem that we have for ourselves. What does it tell us if we should experience some imperfection or sin? and find that we are surprised, troubled, and impatient. Without doubt, it is that we think ourselves to be something good, resolute, and solid. And consequently, when we see, effectively, that none of this is true, and that we have had our heads in the sand, that we were mistaken as a consequence, we feel troubled, offended, and ill at ease. If we knew ourselves well, Rather than being flabbergasted to find ourselves on the ground, we would wonder how we manage to remain standing. 4. All things contribute to the good of those who love God. <clears throat> All things contribute to good for those who love God. And as a matter of fact, since God can and does know how to draw good from evil, for whom should he do it, if not for those who, without reserve, have given themselves to him? Yes, even sins, from which God by his goodness defends us, are reduced by divine providence to good for those who, are, who belong to him. Never would David have been so full of humility had he not sinned, nor would Mary Magdalene have been so full of love for her Lord, if he had not remitted so many of her sins. And never could he have forgiven her these sins if she had not committed them. You see, my daughter, this great architect of mercy, he converts our miseries into grace and makes salutary medicine for our souls from the venom of our iniquities. Tell me, please, what could he not do with our afflictions, our sufferings and the persecutions that we endure? If, then, you are ever touched by some unpleasantness, from wherever it may come, assure your soul that, if it loves God, everything will be converted to good. And although you may not see the means by which this good will happen to you, be assured that it will happen. If God allows your eyes to be blinded by the mud of ignominy, it is to give you a clear vision as a way of honouring you. If God makes you fall, as he did with Saint Paul, whom he threw to the ground, it is to raise you up to his glory. 5. One should absolutely desire God alone, the rest in moderation. One should only want God absolutely, invariably and inviolably. But regarding the means of serving him, 
one should only desire them slowly and gently, so that if we are prevented from using them, we would not be greatly upset. 6. Trust in Providence The measure of divine providence in us depends on the degree of trust that we have in it. Do not anticipate the unpleasant events of this life by apprehension. Rather, anticipate them with the perfect hope that, as they happen, God, to whom you belong, will protect you. He has protected you up to the present moment. Just remain firmly in the hands of his providence, and he will help you in all situations, and at those times when you find yourself unable to walk, he will carry you. What should you fear, my dearest daughter, since you belong to God who has so strongly assured us that for those who love him, all things turn into happiness? Do you think of what may happen tomorrow, because the same eternal Father who takes care of you today will take care of you tomorrow and forever? Either he will see that nothing bad happens to you, or if he allows anything bad to happen to you, he will give you the invincible courage to bear it. Remain at peace, my daughter. Remove from your imagination whatever may upset you, and say frequently to our Lord, O oh God, you are my God, and I will trust in you. You will help me, and you will be my refuge, and there is nothing I will fear. Because not only are you with me, but also you are in me and I in you. What does a child in the arms of such a father have to fear? Be as a little child, my dearest daughter. As you know, children don't concern themselves with many matters. They have others who think for them. They are strong enough if they remain with their father. Therefore, act accordingly, my daughter, and you will be at peace. 7. One should avoid haste. You should treat your affairs with care, but never with hurry or worry. Don't rush to your tasks, because any haste upsets your reason and judgment, and even prevents you from doing well the very thing that you are hurrying to do. When our Lord reprimanded St. Martha, he said to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and upset over many things. You see, if she had simply been caring, she would hardly have been troubled. But because she was worried and anxious, she becomes hurried and upset. And this is why our Lord reprimanded her. Never is a task accomplished with impetuosity and haste done well. Therefore, accept with peace all the tasks that come to you and try to accomplish them in order, one after the other. 8. Peace when confronted by our faults. We must hate our shortcomings, but with a hate that is tranquil and peaceful, not with a hate that is fretful and troubled. And yes, we must have the patience to see our shortcomings and to profit from a saintly abasement of ourselves. Failing that, my daughter, your imperfections, which you see very acutely, will trouble you even more keenly, and by this means maintain themselves, and there is nothing which sustains or defects more than a sense of anxiety and haste to eliminate them. 9. Gentleness and peace in one's zeal towards others. My daughter, God has granted you a great mercy to have recalled your heart to the gracious support of others and to have poured the holy balm of sweetness of heart toward your fellow men into the wine of your zeal. That's all that you needed, my dearest daughter. Your zeal was altogether good, but it had the defect of being a little harsh, a bit too urgent, a bit anxious and irritable. Now it has been purified of these things. From now on, it will be gentle, kind, gracious, peaceful and enduring. From the letter to a mistress of novices. 10. And finally, accepting without becoming troubled, not always being able to ma maintain one's peace. Strive, my daughter, to maintain your heart at peace by being even-tempered. I don't say maintain your heart at peace, but I say strive to do so. 
This should be your main concern, and beware of occasions for troubling yourself, because you cannot moderate so suddenly the ups and downs of your feelings. Footnote. These passages were translated directly from the French Ouvre Complète, published by the Visitation d'Annecy. An English language version can be found in the book Serenity of Heart, Bearing the Troubles of This Life, Sophia Institute Press, 1997. Saint Teresa of Avila Genuine and False Humility Let us beware also, my daughters, of certain forms of humility that are suggested by the devil. He throws us into the most lively disquietude by depicting the gravity of our sins. This is one of the areas where he troubles souls in many ways. Everything these souls so do, do seems to be surrounded by danger. All their good deeds, as good as they may be, seem unuseful to, to them. Such discouragement causes them to give up. They feel, feel powerless to accomplish any good because they imagine that everything that is praiseworthy in others is bad in themselves. Humility, as great as it may be, does not disquiet, trouble, or agitate the soul. It is rather accompanied by peace, joy, and repose. Without doubt, awareness of misery clearly shows the soul that it merits hell and plunges it into affliction. It appears to the soul that all other creatures must view it with horror, and justly so. The soul does not dare, in a manner of speaking, ask for mercy. But when humility is genuine, this pain fills the soul with such sweetness and contentment that the soul would not like to be deprived of it. It does not trouble the soul and hardly constricts it. Rather, on the contrary, it enlarges it and makes it better able to serve God. This has nothing in common with the other type of pain, which upsets all things, agitates everything, completely disturbs the soul and is full of anger. In my opinion, the devil would like us to believe that we possess humility, and if he could, he would like to cause us in exchange to lose all confidence in God. From The Way of Perfection, Chapter 41. Marie of the Incarnation Abandonment to God's Will If we could, with a single interior glance, see all the goodness and mercy that exists in God's designs for each one of us, even in what we call disgraces, pains and afflictions, our happiness would consist in throwing ourselves into the arms of the divine will with the abandon of a young child that throws himself into the arms of his mother. We would behave in all things with the intention of pleasing God, and then we would maintain ourselves in a holy repose, fully convinced that God is our Father, and that he desires our salvation more than we ourselves desire it. François-Marie Jacob Liebermann, a converted Jew, founder of the Fathers of the Holy Spirit. Extracts of Letters of Spiritual Direction 1. Peace, the reign of Jesus in the soul. The best ways to establish in ourselves the admirable reign of Jesus are precisely those of con continual prayer and peace of soul. Remind yourself of this constantly and strongly establish this truth in your spirit and in your heart that the best, the best way and even the infallible way of being in continual prayer is to keep one's soul at peace before the Lord. Pay attention to these words, keep your soul at peace. It is an expression employed by our Divine Master. Your soul should always be enclosed in itself, or better enclosed in Jesus who dwells therein, not imprisoned or locked up under a key, but in gentle repose, kept in Jesus who holds it in his arms. Effort and contention constrict the soul. But a gentle repose, a peaceful manner of behaving, and a steady, measured and quiet interior action expand it. 2. 
peace, a condition for docility of spirit. Our souls, shaken and tormented by their own forces, tossed to and fro, right and left, cannot allow themselves to belong to the spirit of God. They would find their strength, their richness and all their perfection in the spirit of our Lord, if only they were willing to abandon themselves to his guidance. But because they leave the spirit of our Lord and want to act by themselves and in themselves, they only find in themselves trouble, misery and the deepest powerlessness. We should aim for this peace and this inner moderation with a view to living only in God and through God, in all sweetness and submission, and striving steadfastly to renounce ourselves. One must forget oneself in order to continually direct one's soul toward God and keep it gently and quietly before him. 3. Confidence in God I would like to be able to strongly recommend you for having so little confidence in our Lord. You should not fear him. This greatly offends him who is so good, so sweet, so kind and so full of tenderness and mercy toward us. You may stand before him in complete embarrassment because of your poverty and abjectness, but this embarrassment should be that of the prodigal son, after his return, confident and full of tenderness. This is the way you should appear before Jesus, our good Father and Lord. You are still in fear of not loving him. It is more likely in these moments, my dearest, that you love him the most and that he is closer to you than ever. Don't measure your love of our Lord by the depth of your feelings. This is truly a small measure. Abandon yourself into his hands with confidence. Your love will increase more and more, but you will not notice it, and that does not matter. 4. Don't let your misfortune upset you. Don't ever allow yourself to become upset by your misfortunes. In face of your misery, you should find yourself in this situation by the will of God. Remain humble and lowly before God and be at, at great peace. Respond to all misfortune, whatever it may be, with gentleness, peace, tenderness and interior moderation before God, abandoning yourself simply into his hands so that he may make of you and in you what he pleases. Wish calmly and peacefully to live only for him, through him and in him. 5. Don't let your apparent lukewarmness upset you. Don't allow yourself to become disheartened or discouraged if it appears that you are making no progress, if you are faint-hearted and lukewarm. If you should see that you are still subject to natural affections, thoughts of pride and sad feelings, simply strive to forget all these things and turn your mind toward God, standing before him in the quiet and continuous desire that he made of you and in you his holy pleasure. Aim only at forgetting yourself and at walking before him in the midst of your poverty, without ever looking at yourself. As long as you are concerned with the capriciousness of nature, you will be busy with yourself. And as long as you are busy with yourself, you will not make much progress on the way to perfection. These capricious movements will stop only when you hold them in contempt and forget them. Besides, I assure you that they are of no importance, nor of any consequence. Don't pay any attention to them. Only look at God, and this with a pure and simple faith. 6. Don't worry about your falls. Always forget the past and never worry about your falls, many as they may be. So long as you get back on your feet, no harm will have been done. Whereas a great deal of harm will occur if you lose heart or if you berate yourself too much for your failures. Do everything with the greatest possible calm and serenity and out of the greatest, purest and holiest love of Jesus and Mary. 7. Patience One of the principal obstacles one encounters on the way to perfection 
is the pre precipitous and impatient desire to progress and to possess those virtues that we feel we don't have. On the contrary, the true means of solidity advancing, solidly advancing, and with giant steps, is to be patient and to calm and pacify these anxieties. Don't get ahead of your guide for fear of getting lost and straying from the path that he indicates, because if you do, instead of arriving safe and sound, you will fall into a pit. Your guide is the Holy Spirit. By your struggles and worries, by your anxiety and haste, you overtake him with a pretense of moving more quickly. And then what happens? You stray from the path and find yourself on terrain that is harder and rougher, and far from advancing, you go backwards. At a minimum, you waste your time. 8. Let the Spirit of God act. When it pleases God to create the universe, he worked with nothing, and look at the beautiful things he made. In the same way, if he wants to work in us to accomplish things infinitely beyond all the natural beauties which came from his hands, he doesn't need our becoming so agitated to help him. Rather, let him work by himself. He likes to work with nothingness. Let us stay peacefully and quietly before him and simply follow the changes that he produces. Let us then keep our souls at peace and our spiritual forces at rest before him while awaiting every motion and sign of life from him alone. And let us endeavour not to move, will or live, except in God and through the Spirit of God. It is necessary to forget oneself and continually direct one's soul toward God and leave it calm, calmly and peacefully before him. 9. Moderating one's desires. The main occupation of your soul should be to moderate its movements and to acquire a humble attitude of submission and abandonment into the hands of God. You are allowed, it is even good, to desire your spiritual advancement, but this desire must be calm, humble and submissive to the will of God. A poor beggar who begs insistently makes people impatient and gets nothing. If he begs humbly with gentleness and kindness, he touches those from whom he is begging. Excessively insistent desires come from nature. Everything that comes from grace is gentle, humble and moderate. It fills the soul and makes it good and submissive to God. Your particular effort should therefore consist in moderating the movements of your soul, keeping it calm, submissive and humble before God. You wish to progress on the way to holiness. It is he who gives you this desire, and it is also he who must accomplish it. Accomplish it. St. Paul says that it is God who makes us want to do, want, makes us want and do. We cannot want anything in the realm of grace by ourselves. It is God who gives us this desire. When we have it, we cannot bring it to fulfilment by ourselves. God gives us the means. Our role is to be faithful in following God's lead, leaving him to do in us what seems best to him. To worry, to hurry in carrying out the good desires that he inspires in us is to spoil the work of grace in us and to draw us away from our perfection. Let us not try to be perfect immediately. Let us undertake our accomplishments with calm, with a peaceful fidelity to that which he demands of us. If it pleases him to move our boat more gently than we should desire, let us be submissive to his divine will. When we always see the same faults in ourselves, let us remain in our lowliness before him. Let us open our souls to him so that he may see our wounds and our scars, that it may please him to heal us when and as he desires. Very simply, let us try not to follow the impulse of these faults, and in that regard, let us employ as our only means, keeping ourselves prostrate humbly before him, with our poverty and misery in full view, enduring the onset of our faults with calm, patience, gentleness, 
confidence and humility before God. Keenly determined to be everything to him in spite of our faults and not to give in to them but to endure them until the end of our lives, if such is his will. Because, mark this well, once our souls refuse to consent to these faults, they are no longer culpable. God is no longer offended, and on the contrary, our souls will profit greatly for their advancement. 10. Living in the present instant. Be docile and pliable in the hands of God. You know what you must do to achieve this. Keep yourself at peace and in complete repose. Never become upset and never trouble yourself about anything. Forget the past. Live as though the future does not exist. Live for Jesus in every moment that you are living. Or better, live as though you have no life in yourself. But allow Jesus to live in you at his leisure. To walk thus in all circumstances and in all encounters, without fear or worry, is the becoming is becoming the children of Jesus and Mary. Never think of yourself voluntarily. Abandon the care of your soul to Jesus alone, etc. It is he who takes the soul by force. It belongs to him. It is therefore up to him to take care of it, because it is his property. Do not fear so much the judgment of such a tender master. Generally speaking, banish all fear and replace this feeling with love. In all of this, act gently, sweetly, steadily, without haste, without anger. Act as if you were dead when the need is there. Walk in this fashion in all graciousness, abandonment and complete confidence. The time of this exile will end and Jesus will belong to us and we to him. Then, then each of our tribulations will be a crown of glory for us that we will place on the head of Jesus because all glory is his alone. 11. Our incapacities, a subject not of sadness and distress, but one of peace and joy. The sight of our incapacities and our nothingness should be for us a great subject of peace by convincing us that God himself wishes to operate in us and through us to accomplish all the wonderful things for which he has destined us because he knows ever so much better than we our poverty and our misery. Why then has he chosen us knowing that we can do nothing if not to demonstrate with evidence that it is he who will do the work and not we? But a subject of still greater joy, it seems to me, is that our extreme misery and ignominy place us in the absolute necessity of always having recourse to our God and keeping closely united with him at every moment and in all the circumstances of our lives. We depend on him more than our bodies depend on our souls. Is it troublesome, I ask, for our bodies to be in continual dependence on our souls and to receive from the soul all life and movement. On the contrary, this is the very glory of the body and highly agreeable to it, because it thereby becomes a participant in a life that is much more noble and elevated than it would have by itself. The same thing is true with regard to our dependence on God, but in a far superior way. The more we are dependent on him, the more our souls acquire grandeur, beauty and glory, so much so that we can heartily glory in our infirmities. The greater our infirmities, the greater too our joy and happiness, because our dependence on God becomes that much more necessary. Thus then, my dear son, do not be disturbed any longer if you feel yourself weak. On the contrary, rejoice, because God will be your strength. Only take care to keep your soul ever turned towards him in the greatest possible peace. The most perfect abandonment and the greatest embarrass embarrassment and humiliation of yourself. Footnote. This passage was translated directly from the French edition of Lettres du Venerable Père Liberman, Letters of the Venerable Father Liberman, compiled 
by L. Virgil, Paris, 1964. Padre Pio, Capuchin priest and stigmatist, canonised by Pope John Paul II on June 16, 2002. Peace is the simplicity of spirit, the serenity of conscience, the tranquillity of the soul, and the bond of love. Peace is order, it is the harmony in each one of us. It is a continual joy that is born in witnessing a clear conscience. It is the holy joy of a heart wherein God reigns. Peace is the way to perfection, or even better, in peace dwells perfection. And the devil, who knows all this very well, does everything possible to cause us to lose our peace. The soul need be saddened by only one thing, an offence against God. But even on this point, one must be very prudent. One must certainly regret one's failures, but with a peaceful sorrow and always trusting in divine mercy. One must beware of certain reproaches and remorse against oneself, which most of the time come from our enemy who wants to disturb our peace in God. If such reproaches and remorse humble us and make us quick to do the right thing, without taking away our confidence in God, we may be assured that they come from God. However, if they confuse us and make us fearful, distrustful, lazy or slow to do the right thing, we may be sure that they come from the devil and we should consequently push them aside, finding our refuge in confidence in God. Here ends Searching for and Maintaining Peace, a small treatise on the peace of heart by Father Jacques Philippe.